there. Welcome to the Atheist Experience. I'm your host, Russell Glasser, and with me today is Phil Session. Hello, everybody. Today is Sunday, November, 2000, November 20th, 2016. We are a live call-in, internet-based atheist TV show broadcasting from Austin, Texas, dedicated to promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. You can watch us live every Sunday on YouTube or Ustream.tv. The official Atheist Experience website is www.atheist-experience.com. You can provide feedback by commenting on the official show blog at freethoughtblogs.com slash AXP. You can email us at tv at atheist-community.org, and you can also join the Atheist Experience official discussion group on Facebook. If you enjoy this show, please check out our related podcast, The Nonprofits, currently airing on the first and third Wednesdays of this month. You can find links at the Atheist Experience website, and the next Nonprofits will probably be recorded on December 7th. I don't think there's any conflict there. As always, the cast and crew of The Atheist Experience will be going to dinner after the show at Star of India at 2900 West Anderson Lane. We'll arrive there around 6.15 p.m. or close to that. And a couple, just one little announcement. Uh, it looks like the schedule has shows that would fall on December 25th, which is Christmas, and January 1st, which is New Year's Day. Neither of those shows will happen, so <laughs> enjoy a vacation from this show. <laughs> Rejoice, Christians! How are you today, Phil? Um, I'm doing well, I'm doing well. I'm just checking out the new digs that we have around yeah, here. Yeah. There's been some movement around in the studio. I think studio, they're so. not permanent. I think they're covering up some... Uh, construction or something they're uh, they're yeah. they're changing things around uh, but it looks nice yeah. honestly I like the way the it is I like the shirts I like the everything I'm, I'm kind of blocking the uh, godless bitches shirt back here a little <laughs> yeah so slightly well, but it's <laughs> when's the last time godless bitches happened it was oh like, boy mm, it's been a while years it's been a while for that. <laughs> yeah that it's too bad but we I still do. hold a candle for them I do getting the band back together someday <laughs> <laughs> um but I guess anyway. uh, so I guess we're gonna uh, move on to our our guest for yeah okay uh, this portion right now. Uh, so we have a special guest on for the for the beginning. Uh, hey everybody, it's Daryl Ray. <laughs> Hi guys. Hi Daryl. Uh, I am glad to be back on with you guys. Only trouble is I'm by phone. I'd really rather be in the studio. Where yeah. Can go out <laughs> well, we wish you were here, man. You afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I uh, wish I'd prepared more of an intro to the ridiculous number of things that you do, but I think you're going to have to do that yourself in case there are noobs to the atheist experience watching. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, all right. Well, the reason I'm uh, talking to you guys is I want to talk a bit about um, my organization, our organization, Recovering from Religion. I'm sure you guys know about it. But Very well, yes. You may not. Yeah, so it's an organization I helped start back in 2009, and now we're literally worldwide with uh, <coughs> dozens and dozens of volunteers helping us uh, do all sorts of stuff. But and uh, the, am the I focus... right? Am I right that that's an organization primarily for outreach to people who have been? Uh, well, no, I'm thinking of the clergy project. Um, yeah. But... <laughs> no, right. no, not. To... We do cooperate very closely with the clergy project. Yes. In fact, we one of our programs is very important to them. Our secular therapy project mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. helps helps the clergy project. But this isn't but no, for ex clergy. Uh, yeah. This is general outreach to uh, large numbers of people who are uh, maybe breaking away from their religious roots and need some kind of support network. Right. 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 And whether you're a Mormon, a Muslim, a Hindu, a Christian, it doesn't matter. Anytime you start asking too many questions, you run in danger of getting uh, having all sorts of social problems, like your family might disown you, or you might get stoned to death in some countries, and you know, or at least you won't get any turkey on Thanksgiving. For some people in the United States, that's <laughs> that's possible. It's it's just just it's and it could be very dis disconcerting to um, say a teenager uh, who's just learning of their about their sexuality and they're told they can't masturbate. 
um, or <laughs> that's or a real that's uh, an American tragedy right there. Yeah, <laughs> or, or an LGBT kid who's who knows they're gay but can't say anything, and you know what do they do? They're, where do these people turn when they realize their religion is going to send them to hell or tell them condemn them or kick them out of the house? So that's why I founded Recovering from Religion to to help people to give a place for people to land, to, to, to talk to other people who've been through the same thing and, and have a caring but non, non-judgmental non uh, ear to, to listen to them. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I really, right. I really, oh, I'm sorry <laughs> for interrupting, but Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, you just t- uh, touched on the subject as far as uh, people that are LGBT that are just coming out and, um, you know, grew up in a religious household, live in a, a deeply religious family, things of that sort. Like I... Um, you know, a lot of my family was mostly accepting on that side, but uh, when I was first coming to grips that I was indeed gay, and before I'd actually come out to any of my family, um, I was lucky enough to have friends in college at that time uh, that really helped me uh, through that process and gave me support uh, to find who mm-hmm. I was. Um, you know, not to somebody that I can talk without being worried about being judged or being ostracized from things of that sort, just to have a good uh, framework there. So that uh, my friends were invaluable uh, during that time as far as uh, me really coming to grips with who I was at that time. Right, it, it right. Was just in, you know, I, I love what you were talking, uh, you were just talking about that it, this can be a resource for those out there who may not necessarily be so lucky as to have that framework already right. uh, in their lives because, I mean, I had, I went to college, I had um, a lot of friends who were open, um, I had some in high school a little bit as well, uh, who were open and accepting as well, but not everyone on that side. And so for yeah, those... Yeah, if, if you're in a little town in, a little, in, in Arkansas, or right. if you're born in somewhere in Utah, there is no support system around you. Right, right. So I, I, I really love it. Yeah. So we've got several, we've got several programs that we try to help people. The, the, the first one I started was with um, a local meetup group. And I just said, anybody want to come talk about, you know, getting out of religion? This was back in 2009, and I had 11 people show up, 10 of whom I didn't know. And three hours later, the uh, restaurant um, manager was kicking us out because they were closing the restaurant down. And all I asked was, how did religion hurt you, and how are you better when, since you left? And, wow, it just opened a floodgate. And I re- recognized at the time that I had a tiger by the tail. There was, there was a real need for people to talk about this stuff. And somebody who was non-judgmental, I wasn't trying to convert them. I wasn't trying to say don't believe in God or do believe in God. I, I, I was just there as a neutral, neutral ear, and they loved it. They loved it. Yeah. And before three months had gone, we had two more groups here where I live in Kansas City, and now we've got dozens of groups all over the United States, even in the world. We got groups in London. And, yeah, uh, I I was just talking to a to a friend about the show today, and I was saying that one of the most important reasons to be open and active about your atheism, if you are a person who is in a position to get away with it, is that. Uh, there are all kinds of people who don't have those kinds of connections in their regular lives and having someone right. to uh, get in touch with in private or on a show like this is yeah. very, very meaningful to them, which is something that I have learned over time and didn't didn't really absorb at first because I grew up in a secular family. But it's, yep. uh, it's very difficult for people who are isolated in religious communities. Yeah, you don't know. Well, you do know probably how many people have been able to quietly check challenge their beliefs because they listen to the atheist experience. I, but you also, I wouldn't know for sure. But yeah. I hope it's a there's lot. There's a lot out there. <laughs> it is. I. Well, the oh, and by I'm the way, you if you are one of those people, feel free to write in at tv at atheistcommunity dot org or. Uh, post something on the, the Atheist Experience official discussion group on Facebook. <laughs> plug, plug. Well, the reason I mention that is because we get people coming to our groups, recovering from religion groups, our meetup groups, that say, I, I first started exploring this when I watched the Atheist Experience. Aww. And then Matt Delahunty made a talk somewhere and mentioned recovering from religion, and that's why I found your group. 
So you guys have helped us, and you are helping lots of people out there uh, mm-hmm. to find us. So we're we're thrilled with that, and that's it's a really big <laughs> big thing for us. Well, that's the second, awesome. these, the second. Yeah, go ahead, Phil. Oh no, no, I was I was just about to um, to talk about your telethon a little bit there, but if you had something else, yeah, you can go for yeah. it. Well, yeah, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, right now we're we're in fundraising. It costs us money to do some of the programs. One program I haven't mentioned was the hotline project. We have a hotline that people can call and a chat line that people can text us to ask questions, to deal with difficult issues, to get resources. And, and we're not a deconversion. It's not what our, we're all about. We're not into anything like that. We just want to help people get the best information. So we can point them to all sorts of resources. And and w- w- you're one of the resources. We recommend the Atheist <laughs> Experience to, uh, what to is, our people. What is the phone number for the hotline project? <laughs> The hotline is one eight four. I doubt it. Oh wow, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> one eight four. I doubt it, and it's been and, going for almost two years now. And you can call anytime, or are there hours? No, yeah, there's there's hours. We wish we could call anytime, but we don't have enough volunteers to. Mm-hmm. It, we're all nobody has paid anything in our organization. It's all volunteers, so we depend on people volunteering their time to answer the hotline. And if you want to volunteer, um, you can also call the same number and they'll set you up, right? No, no. Oh, uh, if sorry. they want to volunteer, they, they can go to recoveringforreligion.org and hit the volunteer button and fill out the information sheet. Because we don't, we will train you how to uh, answer the phone. Yeah. Yeah. We aren't going to just let you start answering phones <laughs> with no training. And Good. We're that's also that's how you know that there aren't... Uh, <laughs> weirdos answering your call yeah, when you call the hotline project. Exactly. Yeah, you go through a, a vetting process, you go through a training process, you go through a supervisory process, and when you're finished, you have some really cool skills. Our mm-hmm. volunteers have told me many times that the skills I learned as a hotline and a chat line agent uh, helped me in my personal life, too. So, so it's like that's free kind of job a, training. A it, it really is, but, you know, we expect you to give some hours to this, give us yeah, yeah, it is free job training. It's, it's free, free life training in in some ways. Uh, so anyway, right now we are. At, you can go to our Facebook page, Recovering from Religion, and we have a live streaming uh, fundraising event because it costs us tens of thousands of dollars to keep this hotline open uh, all year round, and we need we need funds to do that, and among other expenses that we have. So I was calling in to let everybody know that. Uh, oh, and we're interviewing all sorts of that um, you you would be familiar with, probably. We, we've had uh, authors like, uh, I think you've had, um, have you had David McAfee on your show? I know you guys know Shelly Siegel. Yeah, I know David McAfee. I don't, I'm not sure if he's been okay. on or not. You know, you know, Shel, you know, Shelly, you know, Shelly Siegel, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, she's the, uh, the current yeah. holder of our uh, intro for the show is That's actually right. uh, Shelly that does that. There song. you go. Well, we, we just finished interviewing her a few minutes ago. And oh, awesome. JT Eberhardt was just on the show about 30 minutes ago. Seth Andrews is going to be on the show. Actually, right now, I think Seth's on the show right now. So okay. anyway, uh, I'm not calling to compete with you guys. I'm calling to say (laughs) if if people would like to help us uh, help other people because, you know, you you guys at Atheist Experience and we at Recovery, we're in the same business. Absolutely. We're in the business of helping people. (laughs) Although business implies that we'd get paid, which we don't. (laughs) Uh, Although... (laughs) Although you can also donate to the atheist uh, community of Austin if you want to help us keep up this fine work. But first, do, uh, donate to uh, Recovering from Religion because uh, they need it right now. Right. And, give Tim, give 10 bucks to Recovering from Religion and give 10 bucks to Atheist Experience right now while you're, <laughs> while you're listening to us. Sure. Yeah. So we'll keep but talking about this program. all show until we get a certain number of pledges. No, just kidding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, channel 13, uh, KERE like all Black over again. Approach. <laughs> uh, but the, the link to donate for Recovering for Lit, uh, from Religion is, uh, you can find it on their Facebook page, Recovering from Religion, on there. They have their live stream there, and they also have their donate and volunteer links there. But it's recoveringfromreligion.org right. slash donate. 
uh, to make that donation right. uh, for right. RFR. And if you need... And I would like to tell about... Yeah, well, and I was going to say, if you need someone to talk to, you can see that number at the bottom of the screen. But for podcast listeners, it's one eight four. I doubt it. Right, right. Go and on. you can also text. We have a whole text function. Hmm. Oh, wow, I didn't but know But there's that. a third program that's really important, and that is the Secular Therapy Project. I was actually on the Atheist Experience about a year ago talking about this. Mm -hmm. But that's um, there's a lot of lot of people who need mental health help, mental health help, and they try to find it, and they end up having a therapist that wants to pray with them or send them back to church or read a Bible. And I mean, it's terrible. There are some really bad psychotherapists out there that are infected with religious ideas, and you know, I use that word "infected" intentionally. Right. Um, so, because of my book, the God virus. The God virus, indeed. Yeah, but yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> but the fact is, if you want to find a good therapist, and uh, you're concerned you don't want to get a Catholic or a Christian that's going to send you back to church, just go to seculartherapy.org, and that's a part of our recovering from religion programs, seculartherapy.org, and you can find a you can register and, and find a therapist that will is secular and evidence based. They won't. They don't use any woo woo new age kind of bullshit. So right. Can I say that on the air? Uh, the yeah, you can. Okay. We we're on the internet. We have no fucking FTC regulations. <laughs> <laughs> as oh, far as I know, I now that. I'm about to get us oh, in trouble. <laughs> we're going to get that letter now. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, and well, also, speaking, warning, sure. speaking of uh, fucking, <laughs> you can also check out Daryl Ray's awesome book, uh, Sex and God. <laughs> yeah. You like thank that you, segue? Thank you. And my podcast. <laughs> yeah, I do. And my podcast, the Secular Sexuality Podcast, where we talk about all things perverted. Right. <laughs> so, uh, Russell and Russell. And Phil would be are very comfortable on my podcast. Right in there. Well, uh... <laughs> <laughs> but all right. Yep. So anyway, that that was what I wanted to talk about. Happy to talk about all the stuff we do, but I know you got callers that are probably waiting to tell you you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, for sure. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> and they're right. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is All what right, I appreciate well, about Daryl Ray. He gets my humor. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes. <laughs> anyway, have, have, people, have, people, have people go to uh, Facebook Recovery from Religion and donate. And, and just listen. There's some cool <clears throat> interviews. Seth Andrews is on right now. So cool people talking about their journeys out of religion. So. Okay. Well, it's always great talk to talk to you. Talk to you guys later. Yeah, it was I'll awesome. See you later, you. All right. Bye bye. All right, bye. Okay. All right, that was fun. All right. uh, There's one more thing I, I will mention before you uh, jump yeah, to a caller. Um, uh, as you all know, every time I'm on the show, I usually announce the upcoming volunteer things that the ACA is, evol is involved in. And the next one we have coming up is the Texas Ramps Project uh, for the Austin area. That'll be on December 10th, um, usually starting at about 8 a.m. Uh, there was a hiccup uh, for last month, unfortunately. Um, the city of Austin, the permits, uh, they kind of stopped all of a sudden. And so they, mm -hmm. uh, the Texas Ramp Projects had, had to get that worked out. And they were able to do so, but unfortunately they weren't really able to build during November like they wanted to. So uh, they're going to try to build at least four or more ramps on that one day of December 10th. Mm -hmm. And the ACA will be helping out with one of those ramps to try to get everything together for the holiday season because of course people are traveling during the uh the later weeks of that so we're not going to wait until the fourth saturday like we usually do it'll be that december 10th so that's the one change on that side but um, for info if you want to sign up or uh, if you want to volunteer all that kind of good stuff it's on our facebook page it's on our meetup page and it also appears on our website and so uh, just check back there about a week or so prior to that uh that bill so like december 3rd or so and we'll have the actual exact location of where that bill will be and just sign up and feel free to come out. I'll be, I'll bring some water uh, usually, but you, you can feel free to bring snacks, things of that sort uh, while you're out there. Since, you know, we don't really know how long it's going to be depending on how long the ramp uh, takes. It's usually about four hours or so. Uh, so I'll put on there 8 to 1230. So come on out. 
for ACA members or non-members at that. We had some <laughs> volunteers from uh, you, uh, from uh, the San, uh, not the San Antonio College, goodness, the Austin County, uh, the Austin Community College. Uh, there are some volunteers out there, and there's a, a couple of people from UT Austin that were also interested who were not ACA members that were going to come out anyway. So uh, it's for everyone that's open to it. Just read about it on our website, Facebook meetup, and uh, you'll get all the information there. You guys are doing great work. Thanks. Cool. Uh, we're going to go to first Chi in Ohio. Hello, Chi. Hello. Hi, what's up? Hey. Okay, so um, the first one may not be as applicable to you as to Matt Dillahunty. What do you have as my uh, notes for the call? As, uh, I don't tell people what the notes say because uh, the audience can't read it. So just just tell me uh, what's on your mind. Okay, so I was interested in talking about um, the idea of hell. I guess I am in a situation where despite being able to explain what I dislike about, say, Moses, Exodus 31, or things Yeshua, Jesus said, or Paul, that I still have a belief in what one might call El Ali, Yahweh, so on. Um, and so while I may reason myself to the idea that I won't go to hell, I have an active belief that I seem to not be able to comfortably get out of that I will experience hell. Uh, kind of an uncomfortable position. Uh, what makes you think there's a hell? I'm not completely confident if one interprets certain sections of the Bible in specific ways, it seems like there is, but I'm guessing it's mostly indoctrination. But I also seem okay. to have this idea of hell as if I perceived it at some point, even though rationally I probably didn't. Okay. Uh, <laughs> trying to think of uh, uh, an alternative example here. Um, do you watch scary movies much? I'm not a big fan. Oh. Uh, or, I mean, I don't know, anything like The Twilight Zone or Black Mirror, any kind of sort of speculative fiction? I I'm familiar with them well enough, whether I watch them Maybe, or not. I mean, the thing about Hell is that it is a story that people tell each other very sincerely in a lot of different parts of society, but it's only one of many, many creepy, scary stories that people tell, that we tell each other as a culture. And I wonder if maybe getting more into scary movies and thinking about more possible things that could happen. I know this doesn't sound like it's very comforting, but it might put in perspective how great the human imagination is because I think that one reason people enjoy watching horror movies is because it's kind of cathartic to feel scared for a while and then the movie ends and you realize that it's just a story people were telling. Yeah, I think, think uh, I think for, for Michi, just thinking about my experience um, when I was a believer, even after I um, went, you know, call myself spiritual but not religious, you know, kind of um, leaving the actual Baptist name Christian behind and just going with that general spiritual route. This is before I actually progressed um, to non-belief in a deity at all. I still, I still held on to that fear, kind of like what you're saying, that uncomfortable feeling that, you know, if I, if I do bad still, you know, if I, you know, steal or kill or whatever else, uh, that I'll still be subject to this punishment of hell. And that stuck with me for <clears throat> years on that side. And so it wasn't until 
years later, even after I had moved um, down uh, to San Antonio, it was, even after that, it was kind of realizing that um, I was focusing on this one particular version of hell. And the reason that I was, I still had, it had a hold on me, so to speak, is because I was taught this, you know, from my early childhood, that this would be the result of what would happen to you if uh, you disobeyed uh, God or Jesus. It, depending on what age it was, it was taught in different ways. Uh, but I remember in one of the churches that I grew up in, uh, they had a, a large poster on the wall, very large, you know, maybe five or six feet uh, tall, and it was the Lake of Fire poster. <laughs> and it had all of the uh, different ways that you could be put into this Lake of Fire. And that imagery of, you know, not, it wasn't showing people, it was just showing words that, you know, submerged within the flames that were on this uh, poster. And that was, that was my idea of hell. And, you know, if I did any of these things, then this is what I would be um, subject to. But after I came to realize that, um, you know, going through my transition out of belief altogether as to why I was holding on to you know, Christianity or, you know, only calling myself Baptist as opposed to the thousands of other religions that have been proposed, um, it eventually came, uh, as I was thinking about it, like the fear of hell, you know, the heaven or hell question, it kind of went along the same lines of saying, why was I focusing on this one religion's aspect? So I was focused on this one religion's afterlife and the consequences and the uh, the qualifications to get into heaven and hell. Why was I focusing on just this when there's been so many well, other after uh, afterlives proposed uh, by other religions? You know, I wasn't scared of what happens in the North Norse uh, mythology or the Greek mythology as far as their underworlds were concerned. Um, and so it kind of logically followed for me, at least at that time. Why would I be afraid of this if they have if the evidence for this hell that I grew up with, grew up believing, and was taught to fear, um, the same amount of evidence I have for that is the same amount of evidence I have for other afterlives that other religions have proposed, which is none. And so that's how I kind of well, started I, I, easing out of that. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I do understand that. And again, th that's that type of thing is what allows me to get to the point of reasoning that even if I have a belief that I seem to be unable to not have, that it probably isn't correct. But um, And while I may have this idea that I have perceived hell, I'm also quite confident that Aaron Ra would believe he has perceived things equally or more vivid, and he concluded that they cannot be true and was able to lose that belief. But um, I'm, I'm guessing neither one of you would be able to uh, think other than what you were just describing, separate from that, rather. Well, I mean, unfortunately, um, you know, it's it's one thing to understand a thing intellectually, but what you're talking about is uh, you... It sounds like you recognize and acknowledge that what you have is probably some kind of psychological hang-up. And getting over a psychological hang-up, I mean, neither of us is qualified to really yeah. give advice on that. Uh, maybe you could consider calling the, the, the hotline project that we just mentioned when Daryl Ray was on. Uh, or maybe you might want to take it up with a counselor. Or... Maybe watching horror movies would be would put things in perspective <laughs> for you. Uh, there are a lot of ways um, to get through them, and I don't know if we can give fully qualified advice on how to not be scared of something that you already basically know isn't true. Right, because, I mean, everyone is unique. Well, so the, the, but that's right. not... That, that's... I'm sorry, but that's not quite what I was meaning to say. It's not that I believe okay. it's not true. Mm -hmm. it, it's that I understand that if I was a more reasonable person, I probably would believe it's not true. But I do still have 
the sense of presence, the act of belief. And I don't think that if I die, as much as I might prefer this, that I will stop. I would prefer to believe that I am a pattern generated by my brain and that once the pattern in the brain stops, I stop. But I, I do still, in fact, have the belief. It's not that I don't mm. believe it, but I'm just afraid still. And so I, I think I was hoping to use Matt as kind of like a neurological hack that he could explain with these things able to be cited in the right. Greek Trust and the Hebrew. Trust me when I say that Matt Wyatt. isn't a licensed psychologist either. <laughs> no, 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 not psychologist, but that right. he would be able to make a statement on why hell, even from a biblical perspective, probably isn't the way I view it. But I, I mean, I'm guessing I can, from the way I can would... do that for you, but if you already feel like it, uh, a more reasonable person would already understand it, then I don't. Uh, then I don't know that a better argument is what you need. Um, although, if you think that you're not reasonable enough to uh, to accept the things that your intellect is telling you, then maybe what you need to do, assuming that you would like to be a more reasonable person, is read more and learn more about, for instance, how the human brain works or where religion came from historically. Uh, I think there are a lot of good books. Didn't, didn't Daryl Ray actually mention that he had a book, The God Virus? Um, uh, yes, yes. But that's that's one of a lot of different books. I mean, I'm not hoping to change your mind on something of this magnitude in the course of like a 10 or 15 minute call. Uh, I think that you should use this maybe as a jumping off point uh, to learn and understand why hell became a part of the culture instead. Because... There really is Apocalypse no there really is no reason to take the concept of hell seriously. All right? I mean and there, you, there isn't any evidence for hell. There isn't something I mean, I mean even the a lot of the features that we attribute to hell in modern times weren't even in the Bible at any point. Uh, a lot of them just came from sources like Dante's Inferno where he straight up made stuff up. Or things that Christians will tell well, each other about the rapture came, from, came the, from, like, writings in the 1800s. Um, as I understand it, a lot of it came from the Apocalypse of Peter, but would Matt probably say that outside of the Apocalypse of Peter in the canon, there probably is no real foundation for hell in the New Old Testament? I can't tell you what Matt would say. He's not here. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, because it seems like there is, okay. but I don't know. Okay, but okay. Uh, just from the way you were going through that, is there probably not time to get onto the morality question? That was my second thing. Uh, you can ask it, and we can give a couple more minutes, but we're going to move on to other callers pretty soon. Uh, if you think this needs to be a longer call, then you can try again another week. Okay, uh, do you know who the hosts are for next week? No. I, no, I don't. <laughs> okay, I, I apologize. All right, okay, um, you can check our website, atheist-experience.com. Okay, I understand. Um, I, I apologize. Thank you for taking the call. Okay, no thanks problem. for calling. Let me see here. Uh, Wheel in Houston, Texas? Yes, Willie D. What? Oh, Willie? Uh, yeah, Willie D. Okay. <laughs> How's it going, um, Willie D.? <laughs> my question, not the rapper. My question is, I'm I'm an atheist as well, mm -hmm. and I go around I go around screaming that I'm an atheist. I <laughs> preach atheism like the uh, evangelicals taught Christianity, knocking door to door. Yeah, I know I probably shouldn't do that. Uh, but I do it. <laughs> it's not my preferred method of communicating with yeah. people. <laughs> Yeah, again, I understand that, but considering the person that was just talking about hell, I have I have a question regarding hell, right? Because the devil is supposed to be worse than God. God worked for six days, so does the devil work for uh, work for a five and take uh, you know say an extra day off, or does he work more than God? Right? Know. Does he work seven <laughs> days a week? <laughs> right? Or does he work less? He, I mean, he's the devil. 
Why well, you can't work more than God? I guess that's uh, what they keep saying. The right. Way, the way that uh, the devil was uh, told to me is that uh, he's he's working all the time, twenty four seven. You know, trying to tempt you into. Uh, seduce you Man, into somebody needs going to talk to, to God work. about his work ethic because <laughs> the devil is obviously a, a better uh, uh, a better businessman <laughs> if nothing else yeah see, yeah, see that's, all, that was, that, that's the second question I just came up with but my first question is is like because I, I meet a lot of uh, like no no I'm, I'm the devil reincarnated the son of the devil <laughs> the devil spawns is what I get a lot of. How can you talk to people where they don't essentially shut down? Um, yeah, I can address that a little bit. Do you want to go? <laughs> no, you, okay. you go ahead. Uh, what, what I usually say is that if, you, if your goal is really to communicate with people and not just to have a shouting match back and forth, it's usually not going to help if you counter their story with another story. Like making up things about what you think about the fictional universe of Christianity. Like you're dealing with mega fans who write, <laughs> you know, who, who eat up all the stuff about that in universe. It's like arguing with a Harry Potter fan about whether, you know, the time travel in Harry Potter really makes sense. Um, and usually, no matter how much you disagree with somebody, you're all human. And so there's somewhere that you agree on something. And then your job is basically to find the point where they split off and start disagreeing with you. Because the farther you get from that initial point, the more difficult it is to find common ground. Which is why I usually don't talk about their specific stories. You know, they, they say something like, well, you're the devil. Just brush it off with, I don't believe in the devil and change the subject. Because the real question is not which parts of the story are true and which parts of the story make sense. The real question is, how did you come to the conclusion that the Bible is a reliable source of information in the first place? And if you can talk more about where you get your information from and like if holy books are a reliable way to find out the truth then why can't i what's the difference between you and a muslim guy who follows the quran like what are your standards of knowing things is a big question that i think needs to be pushed more in these kinds of conversations rather than nitpicking the details of their fictional stories you know what i mean Okay, I, I, I truly understand. I, I never looked at it in that way because, uh, oh, God, I probably should stop screaming that I'm an atheist. Except well, to me, the Bible is like a broken clock. It's like even the two times <laughs> that is right, you still got to verify it. Like you can't, it's like, oh, it's 12 o'clock. Oh, maybe not. It could be four. <laughs> yeah, it, it's okay to um, say that you're an atheist out loud, but also... If your goal is really to have a conversation, then you have to stop not come at people with the assumption that they're an idiot and won't and can't understand their own religion. You need to sort of connect with them and understand they're human. They believe something I think is incredibly wrong. Let's just sit and talk to them and find out why they think that. Let's let's learn more about each other as people. Oh, okay, I understand. Look at you, passion itself, <laughs> consider itself, because I was like, hey, you believe you're a fool or a hypocrite, one of the two, maybe both. Well, I mean, yeah. and you have to be careful because you are going to run into some Christians who are smarter than you, guaranteed. So, uh, sure. they, you oh, well, can't... Yeah, definitely. Right. <laughs> and so when you, yeah, go, when you go into these conversations, um, what is the outcome that you were hoping to have, like before you actually get involved into a conversation, what was your intent going into that conversation with uh, these people that you're running into? I oh, completely to change their mind, to say, you know what, why would I believe this stupid shit <laughs> <laughs> and put down the Bible? Right. That's my intent. <laughs> but, well, but, um, yeah. but is, your, is your actual expectation after this, you know, one conversation that you have, is your actual expectation that they will change 
their mind about this deeply held belief that they held for, you know, possibly decades? Is that your actual expectation at the end of that conversation? I don't believe, well, I don't believe that they're actually going to put it down, but if they, this question that maybe I should put it down, it's like I'm happy with that. If they at least consider, you know what, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I probably should question what what my belief is. And you know, okay. you might be I'm surprised because they might not change their mind during your conversation. Mm -hmm. But your if you go around talking to a lot of people, it is just remotely possible that one of those people you talk to will feel uncomfortable enough with the seed of doubt that you've planted that, like months later, they're gonna have to try to resolve that conflict and realize, hey, you know what? God doesn't make sense. And, and retroactively, maybe you do get the credit, but you can't <laughs> expect it to happen right away or every time. That's just not the way people work. Or to even be acknowledged or even know that you had an effect on this person at all, potentially. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's my stupid arrogance. I <laughs> do apologize. Thank you very much for taking the call. Thank you. It was great talking to you. Uh, no problem. Uh, Good luck. We're all kind of stupid and arrogant at some times, so all you can do is learn from the experience. The atheist experience. <laughs> I it's see what you I, did there. I couldn't help it. It was right there. I just <laughs> low hanging fruit. Yeah. <laughs> Edward in Salt Lake City. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Sorry. How are you guys? Book of Mormon reference. <laughs> We're doing well. What's How up? are you? Hello. Hello. Oh, can you hear can us? Can you hear us? Oh, yes. Yes, I can hear you guys. Okay. Hi. Hey, it's so cool to be on the show. Nice to talk to you. <laughs> I wish you guys on YouTube. You guys are awesome. Thanks. <clears throat> and you're sorry, awesome, I'm too. Just running up, up and down the stairs here. Sorry. Um, hey, uh, so I have a question for you guys. Um, well, I'm an atheist myself, and uh, basically my question is how should uh, atheist people react to, uh, you know, when Christians say stuff like, you know, bless you, and uh, basically when they throw, like, religious stuff back at you, um, what should be the model of the behavior, you know, of the a atheist people? Should we get, like, offended by that? Or, you know, when they say bless you, you know, I'll pray for you, and hmm. stuff like that. I mean... To say, like, what should, I should, what should atheists question. do? I mean, well, no, it's not that. I mean, everyone is an, an individual. Like, you have your own experiences leading up to uh, that point. I can only say what my perspective is and uh, how I approach it. Like, I will usually say thank you. Um, like, say if it happens at work. You know, we, we work in cubicles, things like that. So if someone sneezes, you know, there's anywhere from, you know, 12 to 20 people that heard it. Right. And so, and so you'll hear maybe a random you know, bless you here and there. And so if I sneeze and someone says it, then I generally say, uh, I generally say thank you. And over this, earlier this past year, I kind of, uh, I stopped saying thank you. <laughs> I, I, okay. like, I, I, stopped, I stopped saying anything back. I would just sneeze and I would say like, excuse me, or something like that uh, after I, I sneezed. Uh, even if someone said bless you, I would just say, you know, you know, pardon me, excuse me, something like that. And when someone else sneezed, I wouldn't say anything at all. And so over time, um, at least where I'm sitting, uh, it's becoming less and less common for anyone to say, uh, bless you. I, I'm not saying that that had anything to do with me. It's just it doesn't seem to be a common thing uh, <laughs> uh, too much my, anymore. But. My wife, Linnea, when somebody sneezes, will occasionally say, you sneezed, and I acknowledged it. <laughs> Which is really all that bless you means. <laughs> and, and it's not always clear well, why sneezing gets singled out for special behavior and well, we don't say anything from, when you uh, fart. When, <laughs> I, mean, um, I think it comes from like when people sneeze there's like a well, common yeah. misbelief like your heart stops for a second and you know, right. so you, it's, you gotta be blessed I guess, or it's something. It's based I don't know. on superstition uh, but like how you react to it depends on whether you really want to have a conversation about it at the yeah. moment and if you well, are and, it's not just, and if you are it I doesn't go to the I'm sorry. I, yeah, it doesn't go to the such a particular thing as of you know bless you or something. Mm -hmm. You know, there's many more things that you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, well, I guess my question originally is: uh, some religious people, you know, they get offended when you throw the atheist 
off that damn so to yeah. speak, you know. So you're and, saying uh, they're, that they're saying bless you or I'll pray for you as a way of kind of being passive aggressive against you. Oh, uh, well, yeah. Case. And uh, I mean, me personally, I I don't really care because mm -hmm. I, I know. I mean, to me, it's a nonsense. Whatever right. you know, they might say about that, and uh, but still, you know, uh, I've seen many people. You know, they get offended at that. You know, it's like. Um, don't you dare say you're going to pray for me because that stuff's not going to work. And, uh, you know, and, uh, well, my mm -hmm. question is basically, is that the right thing to do to get offended by that? Or it's, it's just, should I just brush it off or? I mean, you can't necessarily help whether you feel offended. The question is whether you make an issue of it and act offended. I mean, some people do feel offended and some people just don't care. I think when you are trying to consider how to react to it, a lot of it depends on context. For instance, if a person says, I'll pray, to you, I'll pray for you, whether they meant any offense by it is, is very dependent on what the situation is. Like, mm -hmm. they don't know that you're an atheist and you just said, I'm having trouble with uh, my health, and they say, I'll pray for you they probably think that it's a nice thing to say that will actually help you. Um, right. And in that kind of situation, if it's important to you that they understand that you don't like that, you could say something like, you could tell them you're an atheist, or a little more low key, you could just say, hey, I don't really feel like being prayed for. I think I was just trying to talk about it. <laughs> Yeah. or something like that i mean cause, and, right right because that can happen especially like i mean uh like say if uh, someone that was close to you passes away and you post something on facebook or something to that effect uh you might have a lot of people saying oh i'm praying for you or something like that and that's their cultural equivalent of saying you know i'm thinking of you or you know my yes. condolences or things of that sort and so or, when i have sympathy for you because yeah. you are probably sad right now like, that's a perfectly acceptable thing to be thinking, even though they expressed it wrong yeah. for you. And even if uh, you wanted to kind of uh, talk about the point that uh, you're atheist, if someone says, you know, I'm praying for you for whatever situation it happens to be, um, I mean, depending on how you approach it back, you can say, uh, you know, I'm atheist, but I do appreciate uh, your thoughts. Right. Or something to that effect. And, That's a very nice thing to say. And right, I've, right. I've said that to people in person. I've said that to people online when... Uh, people that were close to me um, have passed away and people have sent uh, their condolences by text or by Facebook Messenger or just in person uh, when I was at the service um, or something like that. And it's just, I understand that their heart, uh, in their mind, they're helping. That this, in their mind, this is something comforting to say uh, to another person because that's the way they've been conditioned, that's the way they've been taught, and that's the way that uh, they've probably received condolences throughout their lives as well. And so uh, sometimes I just say, you know, a thank you um, and just keep it moving, depending on if I want to engage or not. But other times I'll say, I'll say, yeah, just as simply, you know, hey, I'm, uh, I'm an atheist, but I do appreciate your, your thoughts. That really means a lot to me. Right. Which and brings the issue to the surface, but it doesn't make you look petty. <laughs> yeah. um, of course, there are other situations where maybe the other person knows you're an atheist yes. and they and they say stuff like, I'll pray for you to take little digs at you. And when you're dealing with it's somebody... That with, or, uh, yeah, they might say, you know, hey, uh, I'll pray for you because you're in the dark and you're like a blind sheep or something right. like that. Which is, <laughs> some people, you know, they might uh, look at it as basically being called, you know, hey, you're stupid. And, right. you know, I will, yeah. I will and, pray for you or something. And uh, I think it's somewhat adequate to maybe not, you know, throw a fit about it, but at least, you know, to let them know as, hey, you know what, I'm, it's basically telling sure. me I'm not, you know, if you are the same thing as calling me stupid. I'm, I don't appreciate that. Yeah, I agree. That can be their intent sometimes. And mm -hmm. if you're dealing with a person who's deliberately rude, you have a number of options. I mean, one of them is obviously to make sure privately that they know that that's not appreciated. I mean, this is an issue that is important in a lot of different environments, and that is explicitly setting your boundaries. Uh, and that is true whether it's in a 
you know, work situations, somebody is inappropriately making sexual advances on somebody right. else. And it's also true if somebody is basically religiously harassing people, uh, you know, you might want to ask, how would you feel if there was a Muslim saying something like, you know, I'll, I'll pray that Allah opens your eyes or something <laughs> like that. Exactly. So, you, so the... you should, I mean, it's, it's totally fair to tell somebody, hey, I think you're kind of being rude to me and I want you to cut it out. And if they know that, but you see, in their eyes, in their eyes, it might not. They might not see it as them being rude. They might see, it, you know, they, they feel might, like it's an obligation. They might not they, see. They think that they sincerely doing the good thing for you, which yeah. is by praying, you know. And uh, so it's kind of like, you know, you might get offended by that. But yeah, I get that. In the same way, it's sort of like you you being offended at them being sincerely trying to be good to you. You know, right? They may not. They, they may feel like you're do, they're doing you a favor, but it isn't about whether they are correct or not, technically. It is about you stating what, their preference, what your preference is and them either respecting it or not respecting it because they accept you on a human level. And if you are in a workplace environment and you've told them, I would like you not to do that, and they keep doing that, then it becomes an issue for the HR department, maybe. And you can talk to those people and say, this person is, uh, is pestering me and I'd like some kind of conflict resolution. And if it's not in a work environment, if it's somebody you know personally, you have the, you usually are within your rights to threaten to cut off some of the communication that you have with that person, even if they're people who are directly related to you. You can say, look, you're not respecting what I told you are my wishes. You either ch change your attitude or I'm going to stop talking to you. It, it really depends on what kind of situation you're in and whether you can get away with not dealing with that person anymore. Mm -hmm. And if you can't, why not? And who can you escalate it to that will help when you, your boundaries are not being respected? You know, I see. One one situation where that uh, the thing that you were talking about when they know you're an atheist and they say very specifically to you, "Oh, uh, well, I'm going I'm going to pray for you," or uh, you know, I, "I'm I'm going to pray that God blesses you," or something like that. That's happened a few times uh, when I do the uh, atheist helping the homeless um, out in uh, here in Austin and down in San Antonio, where there may be someone that of course sees our atheist signs, things of that sort, and um, they make it a point to say, uh, oh, thank you so much, God bless you, you know, really stress that. And um, it's one thing that people come through the line and they'll just say, God bless you, as a synonym for thank you, essentially. That's what it boils down to. But uh, yeah. it's sometimes an obvious difference when they, you know, really stress it uh, to you. Like, it's just, it's, it's a little bit different on that side. And, um, or I'll, I'll pray for the Lord to change your heart, stuff like that. And I usually, rather than being like, you know, confrontational because we're trying to keep the line moving uh, and these are the, are the people that we're are trying to help, these patrons that are coming through the line, um, I usually I say something like, uh, well, that's, a, that's an interesting perspective uh, that you said, well, um, you, know, you know, a couple weeks back or whatever else, I had someone that was Buddhist and they said something similar, but they had a different way of going about it. So that's an interesting, that's an interesting perspective that you have. And I say that to not only to let them know that other religions uh, do indeed exist, but basically to put their religion that they just brought to the table like that on the same platform as all others. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, to uh, they're not special. That, that's essentially what it's doing in a very uh, uh, in a very subtle way is we're saying, oh well, um, you know, you you because you know we have people that come through that say, you know, uh, thank you for helping, you know, uh, but you know you're going to hell or whatever else, which is. Uh, an interesting thing, and I'll come back and say, well, ho well, I, you know, we had a few Satanists or pagans that came through, and um, you know, they had a very different perspective as far as the work that we were doing. Um, but I appreciate your perspective that you decided to show, and you know, they kind of some kind of look at me funny as they keep moving throughout the line. Um, some may or may not say something back; it just depends uh, on the person. But 
I say that like I might be in shock. <laughs> well, yeah, like j just to say, like you know, how dare you compare me to this other religion? That's obviously not true. Obviously, it's not true. Um, you know, exactly. how dare you put me on the same level? But by the same token, well, it is on the same level uh, to someone like me who's looking at religions as a whole, as this whole group. Uh, so I find that to be fairly effective, and I hope that it, you know, lets them think. Um, and I usually don't have too many like repeat people that will come up and do that, you know, multiple weeks in a row. Uh, but I find that that works decently well for people that you know I may not necessarily interact with again. Uh, they may not be back to the table, or um, you know, I don't necessarily want to convert them right there at the table while we're doing our giveaway with hundreds of people in line. But um, it's a, an effective little thing to say that uh, may make them think. They may just shrug it off, but. Um, it's an interesting little conversation that happens there, doing it something like that. Yeah. Mm. I see. Okay. Well, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for taking my call. And uh, you guys are awesome. I watch you. I started watching you on YouTube not so long ago, but uh, your show is pretty cool. So uh, you guys keep it up and uh, uh, spread the word, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ed. Uh, well, it was good talking to you. Years, but, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, guys. All right. No thank problem. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Uh, we just got Sean in Tennessee. Hello? Sean. Hey, guys. hey Sean. Yes. Hey. What's up? Yeah, my uh, question for you today, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, go for it. Okay. My question for you today was... Um, I am an atheist, but I'm also a Buddhist, and okay. I kind of sort of believe in uh, reincarnation, and I just wanted to know your guys' perspective on it, and to see if you um, thought that the research on um, reincarnation was um, legitimate, uh, like from uh, Jim fine. Tucker and at uh, Virginia University. I never heard of Jim Duck Tucker, but define research. What kind of experiment did Jim Tucker propose that would tell the difference between uh, a person who had been reincarnated and a person who hadn't? Um, I, I guess what he basically does, and uh, he's not the one who started this. It's okay. been going on for many years now. But uh, they find people, um, well, Children mainly is what they focus on, and he focuses on mainly children in America uh -huh. who um, have have information on of things that they shouldn't have, and uh, he I really? guess he finds these children, and they they have these claims of of being alive in a past life, and they. Uh, they claim to know these different things that they shouldn't know, and I guess he researches it and um, kind of like throws out the ones that are completely, you know, false, that are bogus, and then he, I guess, writes down and and, and records the ones that are considered uh, valid. Okay, so he in he invites these children in who have been telling stories already about what their past lives were like. And he listens mm -hmm. to and records their stories. And then? And then he tries to verify them by going to the cities that they claim to have been, so, <laughs> where they have no connection. <laughs> okay, to. so here's a guy who wants to believe in reincarnation to begin with. And this guy... It sounds like without a lot of oversight. Yeah, it doesn't. Takes a bunch of details of their story that they have told him. And then he goes hunting to try to dig up information that might support the thing that he set out to prove in the first place. Do you think that technique might be a little bit tainted by confirmation bias? Yeah, it, I mean, what what kind of evidence be, um, could this could this guy come up against that would convince him that uh, that reincarnation doesn't exist? Because it doesn't sound like he set up a particularly controlled environment where, for example, 
a more scientific thing to do might be to look up the information in advance and then have a correct and difficult to answer question uh, and then find out whether they answer the question correctly at a rate that uh, is much more than random chance. If instead what he's doing is just taking a whole bunch of kids who had stories about past lives and then cherry picking only the ones who sound kind of credible, so maybe throwing out 99% of the sample set right away, uh, and then uh, confirming, and I'm making air quotes here, <laughs> their stories by hunting down details and again, cherry picking the details that make it sound good. <laughs> uh, maybe this isn't a very credible scientific way to go about the, approaching the question. Yeah, the, the way you're saying it, it, it would make it not. I, I definitely want to do um, more research on his stuff to see if it is, you know, right. scientific but, uh, in, in a way. I wasn't sure if you guys had ever heard of him or I I or haven't. One of, his, be uh, one of the things that made into the into the media, um, it was a child uh, they said they were a Christian family, and I guess they're not anymore. Um, but they, um, their son kept on. Uh, you could look it up. It's it's a big story. He 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 was a. Uh, he said he was a World War II uh, pilot, and he died in a specific right. sea in a specific location off a specific specific uh -huh. ship. And he he knew his he knew like the people that were like the good friend of the person that was on like that the pilot knew sure. and knew the name of the the plane he or the jet he was flying right but the media is really gullible i mean i hate to break this news yeah. to you <laughs> uh but just yeah. because it's been they'll, reported they'll, they'll put anything out there yeah. right uh and and again you get back to the cherry picking angle and first of all kids can read uh you know, a lot of kids develop particularly nerdy obsessions around the time they're six or so, and they start being obsessed with dinosaurs, for instance. And, mm -hmm. you know, a kid who is obsessed with dinosaurs, you know, will, will talk your ear off about that stuff and know things that you wouldn't think they could reasonably know because they're, they're very, very young. Mm -hmm. um, but and then you combine that with the cherry picking aspect where you have maybe a thousand kids and one of them tells a story that uh, whose facts kind of check out. Uh, that's not <laughs> a reasonable basis to actually start believing in yeah. evolution, which it really isn't supported by any uh Objective well, reincarnation. Reincarnation. Yeah. yeah. You said, uh, you said uh, sorry. What did I say? You said evolution. Oh, son of a bitch! <laughs> <laughs> Do not click that. <laughs> yeah. But uh. Um, just... No. Uh, no. I, Atheist I believe lies evolution, about evolution exposed. I I, uh, can I ask you another question? Um, what is your views on Buddhism? Because. In Buddhism, it's not a dogmatic religion in the sense that you have to believe, like, uh, in Buddhism, you don't have to believe in reincarnation or all the magical aspects about it. Um, do do y'all find it to be an atheist religion, or, I don't know, could, in general, what do you think about it? I haven't... Um... I haven't delved too much into Buddhism um, at all on that side, but you know, if what you're saying, I, I know there's some Buddhists that have kind of a, a deity belief in there, and some that are not that identify as, you know, secular Buddhism. I, I'm not sure if that's the uh, correct term to say it, mm -hmm. but um, like if you just if it's if you're using it just as a framework you know, to live your life, you know, that's one thing. Because um, yeah. even uh, saying things like humanism, uh, which you know is is a philosophy for interacting with others, for uh, living your life, things of that sort. Um, you know, and it's not deity driven. It, it just depends on what all is within those teachings. And, you know, if you can analyze and say, the, oh, you know, whether these make sense or these logical uh, things to follow, but it can just be another secular framework depending on uh, how you looked at it. At least that, that was the way that it was explained to me by um, a few, but this was some time ago um, at one of the homeless giveaways who, a guy who identified as Buddhist, but, you know, non deity. 
believing, but he did uh, believe in reincarnation, if I'm not mistaken, um, on that side. But and that seemed a bit outside since there was no evidence for reincarnation. But uh, the rest of what he was kind of espousing to, as far as you know, finding peace uh, within yourself and uh, with others. I mean, it it sounded like an okay thing. It's just I didn't know all the ins and outs of Buddhism or what all it teaches or the different, apparently the different varieties of Buddhism that exist um, as well. Yeah. So, you know, I, I couldn't, uh, frankly, comment it on it too indefinitely, honestly, <clears throat> without that knowledge. Well, it is a, uh, a non-theistic religion and in, 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 in no forms of Buddhism do they believe in a creator deity, but they, they do believe in different deities but you also don't have to. Um, <laughs> if they define those deities, then we can discuss whether or not they're credible. Mostly they aren't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I agree with what Phil said. Uh, I've, I've done some reading on some Eastern religions, and some of those concepts are kind of cool. But uh, you, And you can get value in a lot of things that don't have any... Uh, particular logical Nathan. merit, like for instance, yeah. you know, I've had tarot card readings done, <laughs> and tarot cards definitely can't predict the future, but somebody who is, has read up on them and is sufficiently skeptical might say to you something like, well, they don't predict the future, they just, we deal out random patterns of things, and they help kind of shake up your mental processes, and, and if like the death symbol comes up and death actually means change and blah, 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 blah. Um, mm -hmm. It can change your perspective and make you think of stuff in a way that you haven't thought about before. But then again, a lot of people who deal in tarot cards are just shysters and do want to uh, convince you that they have magical powers to predict the future. And so I think my answer to the question of whether Buddhism is reasonable is the same as my answer about any of that stuff. If it's just acknowledging that it's an interesting new perspective that provides something to think about, then sure. If they're making specific claims that gods exist, then show me evidence, please. Mm -hmm. um, and my, my last question, I guess, is um, um, do you well, think what kind of experiment, experiment do you think there could be in order to prove or, or to, I guess, maybe not prove, but have evidence for uh, reincarnation? And um, is, is, I, ju is just having evidence, is that um, sufficient, uh, sufficient enough to believe in something? Uh, if it is good and... <laughs> I mean, you know the saying, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidences. Just having some evidence, as in some guy told me it was true, <laughs> is yeah. not, depending yeah. on the situation, is not enough to resolve whether something is true or not. Right, but, and the other thing is that uh, portion of being able to devise a, you know, certain experiment that can... Uh, actually be able to start giving you tangible results that can then be tested again and verify things that are sort of, that's going to fall on the people that are making the claim that reincarnation uh, is indeed uh, does, does indeed exist and is real. That's something that's going to be on their burden to actually uh, facilitate uh, these experiments, you know, go for the peer review. So does they like actually go into that deep research and actually finding out that portion. And if they do, I mean, it will be Nobel, Nobel Prizes galore for <laughs> an entire new spectrum of uh, thinking about life yeah. and the way that our universe works. I mean, it'll just, it'll be world headline news if something like that were to actually be substantially proven uh, to be a real thing. So uh, all I can do is tell them, hey, go for it. Like, you know, right. if you got the money, you got the time, uh, you have the people, the scientists to work on it, you know, devise it, get that hypothesis, get, get your... Uh, procedures in place and uh, have at it, you know, teach yep. us something. Okay. All right. All right. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for guys. calling, Sean. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll pray for you. Just kidding. <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Get off my line. <laughs> <laughs> Get off my show. <laughs> Cut his mic. Brendan, New Mexico. 
Hey, how you doing, Russell? Hey, how are you? I'm doing good. Um, just by the way, before I actually um, wanted to get into the, the question, I wanted to ask you guys for the I believe it was the first caller who was asking about Matt Dill Honey's opinions on hell. There is an actual video. Uh, just anybody else who is wondering, there is a video on his channel called "The Atheist Debates: A Discussion About Hell." Just okay. point out there. Yeah, just just in case you was curious. Um, but I guess the reason why I'm calling in is because I wanted to kind of reopen the discussion from um, the show a couple of weeks ago with uh, Tracy Harris and you. And it's the question on religious freedom. And the reason why is because I didn't feel like she... I, I mean, I, I definitely understand her response and I understand why, where you're going with it, but I didn't have the response I was kind of hoping for. It, so I guess I'll just get straight to the question. Given the fact that religion seems to be contradictory and the fact that they contradict each other, and what I also love is the previous callers, they all talked about something, whether it be about like with Daryl Ray talking about how these people are opening up, like if they're coming out of religion, if they're facing uh, discrimination and stuff like that. And um, they all correlate to that question one way or another. And so um, if I can ask you again, do you, or not ask you, but if I may ask you, do you believe that religions, given their nature, can they actually coexist with each other? And do you believe that it's really possible for people to really express their beliefs? is I think I'll, I'll start with. Well, what do you mean by can they coexist with each other? I mean, in some sense, they do. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. So, so, so <laughs> to, well, I, if I if I ask, or my question, if, I, if, for example, if you're talking about Islam and they, they are vehemently against other people practicing other beliefs, so much so that they have specific commandments that you are to kill them Right. Even though you say that's wrong, is that their beliefs? Like, can they practice that? Or like the previous example I used is with the Christian who said that homosexuality is wrong uh, in, in the last show, or the couple shows ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's wrong, but is that their beliefs? Like, can they practice that? And can they um, be discriminatory if that's their religious beliefs? No, they can't practice that and coexist. I mean, they can believe mm -hmm. that which may be as far as their religion goes. Uh, but obviously, mm -hmm. I mean, we have a complicated system of law, which is sort of pithily summed up by one guy who's, who I forget, who said something like, the, my, your right to swing your fist ends where my nose begins. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> and I'll Google mm -hmm. that if Phil will talk. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, the point is that People should be given as much freedom as possible to do what they want, but not more, because, because there are situations where people's freedoms right. can impinge on each other. Uh, and right. believing right. that homosexuality is no. a sin is one thing. Actually saying, let's string up some queers is a completely different thing that can't be dealt with in a society that also respects the value of life and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so yeah, and, and, and I kind of knew you are going to respond. So to kind of reemphasize, sure, I, I agree with you that they, that that's definitely should be the case where we should kind of allow people to express their beliefs where, you know, as much as they can, so much so that it doesn't impinge on, you know, someone else's right to express their beliefs. But if, if it's their religion, you know, if they say that I believe in this and this is what my doctrine tells me, can they express that? And and so I guess another question would be, do you believe that there are certain boundaries? And if there are boundaries, then is it truly religious freedom? Well, uh, I mean, of course there are boundaries. Uh, and of course mm -hmm. it is, as I said, as much freedom as as you can reasonably give somebody without imposing on somebody else's freedom. And by the way, that was Oliver Wendell Holmes that I was quoting. So oh, there cool. you go. Yeah, it's, it's as much freedom as the framework of the society that you know the people are interacting in allows on that side. So like Russell was saying, it's you know for someone actually having, and people in the United States, um, you know, there's quite a few that do have the view that, well, uh, why? Because it said so, uh, or God said so, or who, however they phrase it on its side. And having that belief, yep. uh, that, like I said, that, that's one thing. Having that portion, you know, uh, talking to your uh, family and friends about it, you know, that's, I mean, it's your belief. It's, 
kind of kind of cut off for a little bit there. But um, <laughs> can you hear us? Yeah. Are you good? I mean. I, th yeah, I think he can because okay. you're still uh, in my ear. Okay, but um, but yeah, I think as soon as that crosses into, well, I'm not going to, you know, someone's walking into my store who's, uh, you know, that wants, you know, a, a gay wedding cake, and I say, well, no, I'm not going to serve you. Well, why? Because my religion <laughs> says, oh, no, that I can't serve you. That you know, you're an abomination. You're a sin. You know, mm -hmm. whatever else. Yep. At that point, you cross, um, you know, the laws of society that. Uh, govern our interactions with one another uh, within that society. And yeah, that, and and that that depends and is complicated uh, sure. because in in a lot of cases there are areas like for instance, can you have a private club where, mm -hmm. for the sake of argument, you have to be an atheist to be a member? Yes, you can. Yeah. And somebody would say that that could say that yeah. that is discrimination against Christians. But I mean, in general, um, people are free to break down and segment into uh, into groups of voluntary association that discriminate against people in some way. And there's not a social conflict. Uh, the reason that the cake baking example is uh, a serious issue is because we as a society have developed a system of laws where uh, some things like public businesses right. are are defined in ways uh, that stems uh, in a lot of ways from historical circumstances like for instance during the 50s and 60s there were there were restaurants that would simply refuse to serve black people and if enough of the restaurants in the okay. area collaborate on that, then you get in a situation where black people are denied certain rights that they can't get anywhere because uh, there's effectively a conspiracy to shut them out. Yeah. So, and that's where stuff like mm -hmm. anti-discrimination laws come come from, and are more reasonable than some people might characterize them. And maybe that was a tangent. Um, you. <laughs> so <laughs> so you might want to backtrack a little. No, 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 no. It's fine. It's fine. No, it's fine. It's just the reason why I ask is because it's literally been on my mind for I think ever since my sophomore year of high school. That mm -hmm. kind of stems from when I was looking at a list about about the books that have been banned in history, and one of them is you know, um, I, I think it might have been the Bible, or you know, one of the examples is you know, The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, and some of the you know, Brave New World I think it was, and. It, I was kind of chatting with the librarian for a little bit, and I'm like, you know, we, we kind of get into uh, freedom of speech, and then we're like, yeah, oh, it's freedom of speech, you know, if I'm okay with it. If, it's, if you know, if, if they say something that's, you know, that I don't like, then, it's, then you know, oh, we can't have it anymore, you know, the political correctness or something like that. Um, but the reason why um, I asked, and I, and I think it was a good example that you brought up the atheist, I didn't actually uh, think about that, is... I think it's, you know, you talk about, like, society and stuff like that. Well, from their perspective, it's not society, it's their God that makes the legislation. You, you know, yeah, you know but what I mean? they're wrong. And so <laughs> if, there's, if there's, sure, 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 but that's their religion. And, and so that's kind of the, the thing that I'm confused about when people talk about religious freedom is, you know, you may say that, but it's like I, I, I look at your, you know, the Bible and I look at the, 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 the Quran and, it seems to me that, at least in those cases, what drives the narratives of those scriptures is the fact that their God is specifically intolerant of other cultures. Right. And so there's specific pronouncements that, that you cannot worship these or, or you'll face some kind of punishment. And so do you feel, I guess to segue into another question, is do you feel that when they say that, you know, we should respect people's beliefs, you know, religious freedom, all that stuff, are they at least in some way being inconsistent with their own scriptures? They, who? Well, I, like, but you say Christian, for example. Okay. You know, uh, when they say that, you know, be, being an atheist is wrong, you know, Psalm 14, 1, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, or something like that, you know. I, I challenge you to find any Christian who isn't inconsistent with their own scriptures, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, oh, no, I, I know, but I'm just saying, like, it, you know, isn't that the case where they say something that's, like, inconsistent, like, you believe whatever you want to, but it's not because it's not consistent with scripture. Then, then could it be that religious freedom is not not what people think it is, and maybe they should use like their own, you know, they should reread their own scriptures 
before yeah, they can actually kind of make that claim. I mean, yeah, it's a fair point that if the uh, if mm -hmm. the Bible or even people's personal religious beliefs tell them that they have to do something which by law they can't do in a particular society, uh, we should make as much effort as we can to accommodate them within reason. But at some point, uh, right. if they are trying to do something that is fundamentally incompatible with people getting along, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> social order trumps what your stupid book says. Yeah. And sometimes um, mm -hmm. what you... And, and, and I, um, uh, sorry, uh, what you were saying, like for no, ahead, religious freedom, um, that depends on who's saying it. Because I mean, if you look around the U.S., you know, like for city council meetings and things that uh, want to be able to say a, a prayer before um, mm -hmm. it starts, well, that mm -hmm. that's you know, for them, oh, that's religious freedom. You know, we're just expressing our uh, religious freedom. However, if someone who's mm -hmm. not of the mainstream uh, yep. religion comes into play, so say if a Luciferian or a Satanist. Uh, wants to come in to give yes. uh, a prayer of their own, then yes. all of a sudden it, it, there's a problem that happens, and oh well, we can't really have these. Mm -hmm. that, that's um, that's not respecting religious freedom, so we're just gonna uh, you know 86 it all the way. But I've heard arguments where people will say, well, the majority is uh, the majority religion is uh, X, so you know that's the kind of uh, meetings that we should have, mm -hmm. but that doesn't necessarily coincide with religious freedom uh, that yeah. they were so gung ho about. Ex espousing depending on you know what the situation was but um, that's always an interesting uh, tip because it's like you know you don't you didn't really mean it you, you didn't mm -hmm. want that Satanist in there you know you didn't want uh, someone dressing in, you know in black robes coming in to give uh, <laughs> the invocation to uh, the city council meeting that that wasn't your intent you wanted someone that was right. a, at least a c Christian denomination to do so whether it's Lutheran or Catholic uh, you know that that I can see that more being all right, but if someone way outside the norm uh, came into play, it's all of a sudden it's like, whoa, we, we, we can't have that. Uh, yeah. so that's not And right. before you yeah, start like, dashing like... off angry emails and tweets, yes, we know <laughs> there is an organization called the Church of Satan that doesn't really believe in Satan yes. and is basically yes. atheist and, yeah, does, and likes Satan to troll ever. people. <laughs> but let's just mm -hmm. say... <laughs> But I, I use the example of Satanists because mm -hmm. that, that has come up in multiple places mm -hmm. around the U.S., which is awesome, honestly. Right. Uh, yeah. When they challenge that religious freedom moniker that um, you know, local you know, towns or cities or whomever were trying to kind of push forth, and they're coming and say, okay, religious freedom, awesome, we're on board too. Uh, so what was <laughs> Sign it like? Us up. <laughs> so it was like the school in Florida that was trying to hand out uh, religious ma uh, material, and so. Yeah. Uh, the Church of Satan, you know, they had their own materials, and all of a sudden, okay, no materials. No, ne never mind. Just no, no one. Just, just yeah. stop it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's 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 kind of like you know, freedom of speech only when it agrees with me, but when it doesn't, then we then have to like you know, we we have to be careful what we say. You know, it's freedom of speech, you know, when it applies to me, but not to everybody else. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll tell you what, living, so, living, and getting along with people in a world where everybody is connected is a big old mm -hmm. can of worms and uh, and coming up yeah. with a reasonable set of rules that everybody can abide by it's never going to be perfect because people are mm -hmm. not perfect yeah. and don't get along yeah and and e and even though I may not personally um, agree with religion I do be I'm very interested with um religious freedom and I'm very interested in having the discussion as to what exactly it means to have religious freedom and so um, I, I do appreciate uh, Appreciate that. Uh, okay. So um, I think that'll be it. Yeah. All right. And just just one more thing. Um, just like, just like a <laughs> well, you got to make it quick. We're, we're, the, Hold we're on. ending the show real soon. Hold so on. Just give me thirty seconds. Oh. Go. Okay. Okay. Just all right. All right. Just real quick. Um, so I want to ask you, tell you guys about um, a quote that I think yeah. is, I would say, a good argument for um, atheism, in my opinion. And it's a quote by um, uh, Paul Harrison in uh, one of his books. Elements of pantheism. Yeah, I mean, to the point, I think but, you know, I, I, I thought I thought it was a good, I thought it was a good, um, a good book. Yeah. Let me tell you, and let me tell you the quote. Just in, see if you agree with it. So, in I think page forty-seven, he says this. He says, "Since God is seen as perfect and self-sufficient, it is not at all clear why God needs to create humans. For what purpose do they serve Him?" Yeah, you know, that's an amusing thing. Yeah. Okay. Amusing? Uh, <laughs> It, it's a All good right. one. People just can look it up. I just want to throw it out there. All right. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye. All right. 
Uh, we are coming up on six o'clock. Uh, you, if Darn. you. Uh, if you are in Austin, you are welcome to join us around 6.15 at the uh, Star of India. I'm going to do one of the exercises, <laughs> one of the one of my favorite weekly exercises, which is the lightning round. Oh, dear. Uh, we got five people left on the line. You get uh, try to keep it under a minute if you can. Joe in uh, California, I'm sorry we kept you waiting so yeah, long. Can you... You want to say something quick or call back next time? Yeah, I'll make it quick. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the uh, commonly heard argument from the theocide that the reason God doesn't uh, tell atheists himself that he doesn't exist be is because, uh, or he does exist, is because it would eliminate free will. And I have a few <laughs> problems with that. One, give you, no, it just give your best one. Somehow. Sure. Um, so. Uh, apparently, there's an amount of evidence that is too much that would eliminate free will. And where do theists draw the line? That's a good and question. Two, if they nope, sorry. And two, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Take the lightning round seriously, people. Uh, whoop, Cook in also in California. You got something quick, or you want to call back next week? No, I'll, I'll just say something quick. Uh, basically, saying I give if it wasn't. So much of a, of a huge uh, campaign with the people at the power that be to keep people so ignorant and, and, and keep them in fear, then us as atheists would have a, 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 a better time of communicating with people, uh, communicating and, and coexisting in society. But we're up against so much powerful people who continue the dogma is why we are still where we're at. Um, and that's what, that's what on the next show probably we can talk about how do we switch that and change that. Yeah, people... Oh, is it even possible? More understanding of each other. Well, yeah, but uh, religions themselves also have a self-interest to, um, to self-perpetuate, to keep their belief mm -hmm. going. And so they have an interest in keeping that dogma, you know, fresh and secure into the next generation. So that's why it's all about getting them early to where they're indoctrinated and they'll hopefully stay within that uh, group, but yeah, they have exactly. a it's rec recognition that they have that self interest. That's you know, a pretty easy thing to comprehend there. Yep. Thanks for calling. <laughs> uh, Seth in Texas, we're uh, we're closing out the show. You have something Yo. quick? Yo. What's up, guys? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you guys that uh, you know, let's suppose that you guys uh, lived in the time of Jesus. If you know. Uh, if you you guys lived upon the time of Jesus and you guys were talking to him, you know, and everything, and he uh, he was actually, you know, as he says he was, you know, in the Bible, as he depicts himself, would you guys believe his word uh, or or no? Did I get to see him rise from the dead? Yes, all of that, you know. Oh, but, but, well. Yeah, you used to. <laughs> That's, oh, a, that's no. a pretty big hypothetical, uh, and if I have strong evidence of that, then maybe I'd have to take on a different opinion, sure. Yeah. You, All right. So you have to take a different opinion, or for sure? Well, Probably. It, it, it's not for sure, but... It depends you know, on yeah. how, 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 how convincing it was. <laughs> right. It depend, yeah, it depends on how much evidence you have, how many supernatural events or things that we would consider supernatural, oh, the claim, things of the sort. Everything. If you witness the whole thing from, you know, to the Moses... Time to, to all of the way to Jesus. I would think it was Noah. worth considering. Please call back next week. And, uh, and would prompt I, more questions. I <laughs> wish that we had longer to talk to you. <laughs> yes, yeah. we would also have additional questions. Yeah. Same as if somebody today came up and said they had just risen from the dead and had a direct hotline to the creator of the universe, I would have a lot of questions. Nate in Virginia, got something quick? Hey, what's up? All right, We're closing out the show. Yeah, uh, wh yeah. Why? Why is social Darwinism wrong? Short answer. What? Why is what? Social Darwinism. Social Darwinism. Uh, yeah. Scientific uh, facts do not constitute a moral imperative. People are free to dis to make the decision about what leads to the greatest overall quality of life. And just letting people die is something that we have decided doesn't contribute to that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, monkeys are closest relative 
you know, do seem to do that. They go into other tribes, you know, chimpanzees kill off other tribes to preserve their own species so do we, as part of evolution. It should, is our goal to act like chimpanzees? Like, why do we, uh, you know, the fact that animals do it doesn't mean that it's something we have to do. Otherwise, we wouldn't have computers. Is there something inherently wrong with it? Uh, <laughs> inherently is a, is a big can of worms yeah. and gets into what is the nature of morality that we don't have time for. Thank you for calling. Benjamin, you're last. Be quick. Yeah, I'm a non-believer, but as a, as a European, having lived in Japan for 25 years on and off, yep. I would have liked to contribute an Eastern perspective on Buddhism but I'm not quite sure the time. I, we uh, don't have time. Uh, can, you say, can you say yeah. a couple of useful things in a couple sentences, or you could call back next sure. week? Maybe in a couple of sentences. sentences um, I, I once had a girlfriend whose grandfather was a Buddhist monk. I was invited to the temple mm -hmm. and talked to the monks there. And typically Western, they called me, because I had questions like, do you believe in God? And <laughs> what's this incarnation thing about? Because as an engineer, uh, the incarnation just doesn't uh, pass the Occam's razor for me. They had the whole recycling of business of souls and things. And they said, you're missing the point. <laughs> and I asked them, what's the point? And they said, the point is the ethics. The stories don't yeah. matter whether you believe or not. And that, that I have experienced over and over again here in a culture that is more Buddhist. Than okay. Anything else? Well, that's yeah. a good thing to keep in mind, and we gotta go. Thank you for calling. Okay. Talk to you again. Thank you sometime. so much. Bye. That's our show. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so much. Now that guy called in too late. Oh, the hands. Okay, <laughs> I thought that was after. Gotcha. Yep. Gotcha. Bye -bye. Uh, it's uh, great to be able to reach out to all of you. Uh, check out Recovering from Religion and consider donating. Uh, do not tune in to the Atheist Experience on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, we will see you next week, and we will see you in 10 to 15 minutes at Star of India. Bye. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. This is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you.